So if someone's, I think what you said was if someone's training for more than an hour mm -hmm. and they're doing both cardio and some resistance training, yeah. they might want to have some carbohydrates during. Yeah. What does that look like? How much or what kind of foods are people yeah. going to? Yeah. If you're doing the resistance training first and then going into the cardio and it's like 90 minutes to two hours of total training, um, I like like that 30 to 60 grams of carbs taken in at some point during in that. I don't think you need to go the full 60 to 90 grams of carbs like you might with like a two hour run session. Um, usually like when I do my back to back days, I towards the, you know, I eat my breakfast. I usually do like my squat day. And then during the tail end of my squat day, I'll eat like two packs of fruit snacks or a couple applesauce squeeze packets or like some crackers or just something like that to get that in. And then I go and do my speed session. Um, if it's really hot and sweaty, I'll also include like an electrolyte during that day. Some people can just do like a carbohydrate drink mix while you're training to have that available. Um, because some of that, that, that fatigue that you might have from that lifting carrying into that cardio session, you know, you know, having your glycogen stores depleted increases that fatigue and muscle damage and demand of the contractility of the muscle. And so I think a lot of people, they struggle with like hybrid or concurrent training, whatever you want to call it, because they're underfed from like, you know, protein's important, but also carbohydrate. And so it's harder to recover from their sessions, but having that, you know, adequate carbohydrate feeding when you're doing that type of stuff can help make it less stressful and less damaging and less fatiguing on the body, but also allow you to have quality in both when you're doing them back to back. Uh, yeah. And I, have to imagine that at least people who are looking to cardio for fat burning like mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier that there would be a person who is leaning into cardio training but also restricting carbohydrates because they're of the view that carbohydrates increase fat storage yes and so i and I, I sympathize with this because i take such a performance driven focus to my to my view of things and so it, this is where it also depends on how much are you doing, right? So your carb needs are, are based off of your activity levels. So if someone is not doing a ton of cardiovascular training in a week, they're not doing 300, 500 minutes of, or more of cardio training in a week, your carb needs aren't going to be as high as those people. And so I think when people say, you know, eat enough carbs to support the activity you're doing, they hear me say, eat carbs until you gain weight and get fat. And, and it's rather that you're using it to support your activity. And so I think a lot of people use cardio for fat burning, but there's a few things to consider here. One, if you're fed going into that cardio session, you're probably going to actually have a higher quality session and burn more calories. Two, cardiovascular training done with the intent of improving your cardiovascular fitness improves your body's ability to burn and use fat as a fuel more efficiently. So like, I think the, the thing people should be focused on with their training programs is improving their fitness metrics more than did I burn enough calories in the session? Should I, am I doing it fasted so I'm burning enough fat? Don't worry about if you're burning enough fat because the fat that you're burning for exercise itself, yes, you're oxidizing more fat, but one, that's not directly related to fat loss necessarily. And two, trust me when I say that I spent so much of my PhD analyzing fat oxidation data, the amount of carbs you're burning in those sessions is still so, so much greater than the fat you're oxidizing. We're talking like grams, like not, not to the extent of which people are thinking that they're burning. You're still using a ton of carbohydrate. And that carb that you're taking in isn't necessarily being stored and converted into fat because one, when you're doing exercise training, you uptake glucose independent of insulin. So your insulin, even if insulin itself was, you know, what was, you know, causing the obesity and weight gain, like people like to think, you have these transporters in your muscle cells, GLUT4, and they come to the cell wall and they take up that glucose and shuttle it in without insulin. So you have that con muscle contraction itself is bringing that in, but then you're essentially using it and bringing it in and putting it directly into your metabolic pathways to burn and use. You're not even at that point in time storing it. You're, you're using it as a way to sustain adequate blood glucose levels for activity so you don't bonk or get that hypoglycemic type feeling that people tend to get when they're underfed during exercise. But it's essentially being directly shuttled in. That's why you want these simple carbs, not these super complex carbs. And it's being shuttled in directly through the bloodstream almost to the muscles or your body's tissues to use for energy metabolism during exercise. So it's not like you're you're not primed to be in storage mode when you're exercising. You're primed to be, you're, you're upregulating your metabolism to burn and use this fuel that you're doing. And so if you're somebody who's gen pop and you're doing like a 45 minute lift and then like 
a short hit session and it's like an hour and 15 minutes, you, you will be fine if you don't eat something. But I'm talking about the people who are doing like an hour lift and then they're doing 30, 45, 60 minutes of cardiovascular training. I would have a little bit of carbohydrate in, in between there. So it, again, it kind of depends on the person, but don't think of your session as a, as a time that you're storing fat or even worrying too much about burning fat. Worry about getting fit, fitter and having a higher quality training session because that's the stuff that moves the needle forward. So what I'm what I'm hearing from you here, and I'll throw this back to you, mm -hmm. is that potentially, if you are under consuming carbohydrates for a certain individual, mm -hmm. and I'm again I'm thinking back to that avatar of the individual, the woman who is putting the hours in, she's training but not necessarily getting the progress. And mm -hmm. earlier you mentioned the importance of intensity. Yeah. So if someone is restricting carbohydrates, doing a lot of exercise, could that be affecting their intensity? Yeah, I think one of the biggest mistakes that women make when it comes to training is restricting their food and or carbohydrate intake too much, too frequently, too often, or all of the time. They're, they're taking a dieting mentality to their exercise training, and I think that's a big thing that holds them back from getting results in their training, especially the ones who are like, hey, I'm working out six days a week, I'm doing all this cardio, I'm not seeing any results, but they're restricting their carbohydrates and they're burning the candle at both ends. And so I think that, you know, when we think about, even if we, we circle back to the, the cycle training stuff, I think the first thing that's the most important for females is to be fed, be adequately fed. Um, and I think that we don't think about things like low energy availability, either in the short term or the long term in gen pop clients. But a lot of, a lot of females are doing things that are eliciting low energy availability within their training sessions. And they're not putting their bodies in a state where they're like, yeah, let's just like, we, we, we want to recover. We want to give up fat. We want to perform at our best. We want to push into our training sessions. And so they're just kind of on this hamster wheel of chronic moderate intensity exercise where they're never really progressing the intensity or the volume. They're just kind of doing the same thing. And your body does adapt to that. So it's just adapting. Right. So just that. like turning up, going through the motions sort yeah. of with resistance training, going through the motions with cardio. So you are putting in the time, mm -hmm. but You're failure to get to the right intensity is sort of stifling progress. Kind of, yeah. And they're not either able to get to the right intensity or they're not even able to actually progress anything that they're doing. So your body becomes almost adapted to that, right? Like you hear everyone say like, in, I mean, maybe not everyone, you hear people say all the time in the fitness industry, don't run because your body adapts to it and then you gain weight. Well, you become more efficient as you do cardio. That's a positive adaptation to cardiovascular training. But people forget that you can progress cardio training just like you can progress resistance training. They think of cardio of just doing the same thing day in and day out. But if you're not fed or you're not able to do that intensity or you're not able to increase that volume, then yeah, you might just be doing the same workout over and over and over again. And that doesn't mean that you're not getting benefit from a health standpoint muscle contraction and oxygen delivery and all that stuff is and the stress in your vascular system like those things are still happening you're not getting no health benefit from it but when you're thinking about trying to push your physique forward or make progress there you might be holding yourself back because you're not giving yourself you know you're not putting gasoline in in the engine you're just expecting your car to keep moving on fumes rather than being able to accelerate or move forward or go faster or whatever that looks like so if someone is in that position mm -hmm. they feel stuck mm -hmm. i guess firstly what are other than not getting progress or, or maybe not seeing progress what are signs that someone is in low energy availability yeah in that state so i i think that when i talk about this because so many people struggle with fat loss or weight loss or being overweight or whatever that looks like they're like well there's no way i'm in low energy availability but there can be short-term acute low energy availability during the day and then there can be also chronic long-term low energy availability and so a lot of the signs of like chronic low-term energy availability are going to be things like obsession with food obsession with body size like those psychosocial things that are really parallel to disordered eating habits and traits and then you also have things like you have, you know, alterations to the menstrual cycle, decreases in your menstrual cycle frequency and ovulatory cycles. You're not ovulating um, or you're not getting your period at all. That's more of the extreme version of it. You have increased inflammation. You potentially have lower bone density, bone loss, things like that. that are, that's one of the biggest concerns of this low energy availability state. But then you also might not be recovering. And if you're not, you know, if you're not making progress in your training sessions, you're not putting on muscle, you're not 
you know, recovering, you feel a like crap. And it, really what I think for most gen pop people is that more of that acute, because I think what they do is they wake up, they have coffee and a breath of air, they eat a salad with barely anything on it for lunch, and then they're like, oh, I'm overeating at dinner, or I'm overeating on the weekend. So they might not be in a long-term state of low energy availability, but they are under eating during the days. And so they're just, you know, stressing their bodies out and they're not giving it the, the fuel it needs to recover during that AM training session that they're doing. Or when they go to the gym after work, they're going in on, on fumes, even if they are, you know, eating enough later. And so there can even be energy, low energy availability in the short term from either low intake like that across the day. But another classification of low energy availability or low energy availability, actually a better way of saying this parallels is low carbohydrate availability. So a lot of the signs and symptoms that come from low carbohydrate availability, especially in females, parallel or mimic a lot of the signs and symptoms or work hand in hand with low energy availability. So not having enough carbohydrate to match your training volume or your intensity or what you're doing. Um, and this is again, more prone in athletes, but I think a lot of females train at the volume of, a, they, of a, what a lot of higher, act, they're, they're very active, they're highly active, and they don't eat or treat themselves like they are. And so they're not fueling themselves appropriately for that. And so if you feel like trash, you're not recovering, you potentially, your sleep's you know, poor, you're always hungry in the middle of the night, your cycles are being impacted, um, or you feel like, you know, there, if you get blood work, you can also look at some of the things that are going on in there, but that's potentially, there's a lot of things in people's lifestyles that can also be impacting that, but you don't feel like you're getting your bang for your buck out of your training sessions, consider, try, like just consider for a little bit increasing your carbohydrate intake and seeing how that feels. And so even when we circle back to the menstrual cycle, we see that if, you're, if your performance is impacted during, during your luteal phase or if your metabolism is different during the luteal phase, we have studies that show that those differences go away when, when women are fed carbs. So like some of those discrepancies in the training and performance go, go away when, when you're fed carbs or you're potentially you know, going to perform equally as well when you're in that fed state or those differences go away. And so I think that's something that a lot of people neglect because they're trained, restrict, restrict, restrict. And it's not overeat, it's eat to the demands of what you need for your activity level and, and, and your body. And so it's hard to say exactly because every person's different, right? You have potentially two very different gen pop people. I think of the person who's struggling with fat loss, struggles with exercise consistency, struggles with yo-yo dieting or on and off eating. And then I think of the, the, the lean enthusiast who's cardio bunny chasing all the all the fat loss, always really highly active, under restricting their activity and calories. But both of them might need to essentially adjust their eating to eat adequately for where they're at. And what that looks like might be different. Um, but if you're not getting the results or progress that you're looking for those things, I usually, especially this, this phenotype, I'm usually like, let's pull back a little bit on that exercise obsession and let's push food up a little bit more. And it's really scary for them to do that. But I'm like, if you, if you do it and you trust me, you're probably going to see your performance increase, your body composition increase, and you're kind of feel a lot better when you're doing it. Yeah. That's interesting. What you mentioned there about carbohydrate restriction kind of mimicking low energy availability mm -hmm. because as i was hearing you go through what someone may experience mm -hmm. they i imagine that there's people listening thinking okay i am experiencing that poor sleep i'm hungry this and that but i can't be in low energy availability because i'm not losing weight yes yeah yeah and i think what's funny too on top of this is there's this this big obsession right now in cortisol, right? Everyone's obsessed with cortisol hit and, hit cortisol. and spiking cortisol and cortisol is making you gain fat and cortisol is doing all these things. But like my favorite fact is like, do you know what brings down cortisol or reduces the cortisol response to exercise? Carbohydrates. Like I think that this, this chronic push of underfeeding for the performance we're at is still so prevalent in everything we talk about when we're talking to women, that it's 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 taking this diet mindset to fitness and performance. And I really like separating those two. Yes, you can have body composition goals and changing those. I'm not against that at all. But don't take that approach to your training, but also don't take a diet that's going to impact everything you're doing in the gym and just runs the hamster wheel of restriction and restriction and restriction where you then are on off. Cause I think what happens is they're like, well, I'm not losing weight. There's no way. And they're either, you know, in some cases they are chronically under eating, or I think in most cases they're very unaware of how much they're actually eating the times when they are eating versus the rest of the time when they feel like they're borderline starving themselves in order to, you know, 
be fit or healthy or what they view as the right way to eat. And then on the nights or the weekends or the vacations or the times off, that's when that that creeps in and they're not seeing that total average caloric intake, but they're oscillating between the state of low energy availability and then being overfed, low energy availability, or even being adequately fed. But you're still in that state throughout the week when you're, you know, the the memes and the jokes of like, oh, I've only had an iced coffee today. I don't know why I feel like crap. Like that's not funny. That's not a meal. You need to actually feed yourself because you're you'll perform better, you'll your cognition will be better and your performance will be better. And you're probably going to see way better results in your training and fitness. And I think one of the most rewarding things for me is when I can get women to trust that. They, they lift heavy, they're not afraid to do cardio. They're not afraid to just to not diet for a little bit and just eat and fuel themselves for the training that they're doing. And then it almost ends up, you, you pull that cognitive stress of always obsessing about your body and then their body composition ends up shifting without as much effort. Because the cognitive effort of doing that high volume of training all of the time and then being micromanaging of your food on people, I feel like makes them feel like they're doing so much more work and effort in the gym that they can't possibly believe that there's an option for them to pull back a little bit on what they're doing or shift and redistribute what they're doing in the gym and eat more food and get more results or better results with half that demand. Like they feel like it has to be that hard for it to work. Mm -hmm.